Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon to all of our East Coast listeners. Welcome to this month's HR Power Hour, brought to you by CoAdvantage. Today's topic, we're going to dive right into how to um, don't drown in documents. This is how you to navigate the sea of employee files. So, fantastic topic. Let's jump right in. Before we get started, I kind of want to give you guys a nice legal disclaimer. Um, this is intended to provide a general best practice of employee guidance. CoAdvantage does not um, render legal advice. This document was not prepared by attorneys, and the delivery of this document does not constitute the provision of legal counsel. So I just want to let you guys all know that before we get started. A little introduction uh, to the broadcast of who is talking to you guys today. Uh, my name is Daniel Mater. I am one of the co uh, one of the um, hosts of this broadcast. I'm an HR specialist here at CoAdvantage. And I will be accompanied by my wonderful colleague, Leah Mana Malais. She is an HR Service Center consultant. Here's all of our contact information. And we will present this to you guys at the end of the slide. So it will be up on the screen for you guys to write down. Uh, we also have the HR Service Center um, contact information right there. So again, if you have any questions along the line, you can email them directly or call us at that number. Um, before we get started with the presentation, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, there is a lovely little uh, chat box on your screen. Go ahead and type your question right in there, and then we will um, do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. So let's get started. A little bit about CoAdvantage. Um, we are the top six, top six professional employer organization. Um, we help small and mid-sized businesses by handling their human resource needs. Uh, we assist with payroll, benefits, risk management, and HR administration. We serve nearly uh, 4,500 clients and approximately 90,000 worksite employees. So I'm going to uh, pass the mic over to Leah, and she is going to um, dive right into our first poll question. Hello. So as Dan mentioned, my name is Leah. I am one of the HRSC consultants here at CoAdvantage. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to put up a quick poll question just, just to get a better idea of what your companies do. So the question is, does your company keep employee personnel files for your employees? That would be yes, no, or do we keep what? Yes, launch question. So go right ahead and uh, answer the question. Okay, I'm closing the poll. I will share the results. Yes, okay, so 95%, that's definitely a good sign. Um, do we keep what? Uh, okay, we'll definitely go into it. So no worries if you have no idea what an employee personnel file is. Okay. So next slide. Uh, so just to clarify, an employee personnel file is the main employee file that contains the history of employment, starting with the job application to all of the termination documentation. Documents that you should be keeping in your employee personnel file are offer of employment, the job description for the position, job application and or resume. It's always good to keep a copy of the resume when you do hire him, hire an employee, especially if you're hire, hiring an employee for a specific skill set. Uh, during their employment, you want to make sure that, especially if they advise that they're proficient in a certain skill, uh, you want to also have a copy of the resume. So if you need to ever go back and refer to the document and just say, hey, you did uh, advise that you were proficient in the skill set. So, you know, that's what we uh, do expect of you. Uh, the W-4 form, the handbook and the policy acknowledgements. Now, in general, the handbook it might be one of your, for a company, it's basically your golden book. Um, everything in the handbook has your policies, how the company, what the company expects of their employees, and if a certain issue or situation arises, you always refer back to the handbook so both the company and the employee knows exactly how the company should be going about in a certain way. Uh, so if an employee, let's say they ever come to you and say, you know what, I was never advised that this is a com policy for the company and I didn't know that this is what I should be doing, you could always go back 
um, pull up the employee personnel file and say, hey, uh, you did assign the acknowledgement, so therefore you did receive the handbook and you do have a copy of the handbook. Now, if there were any questions during throughout your employment regarding a certain handbook, then you know, this is something that you should be referring back to. So it's always, always a good idea to make sure that you always have a copy of all uh, policy acknowledgements and any handbook acknowledgements that go out through um, the employment of the, of the employee. Uh, the next would be emergency contact information, then performance review. Uh, make sure every notice is there. So example, so if you have an employee that may be having a record of uh, that poor performance, you want to make sure that you document that. You like, especially if it's an employee that you don't believe that their performance is improving or um, it's not exactly going anywhere, you want to make sure that you docu document any notices that you give to the employee, letting them know that, you know, the company is not satisfied with a certain with with a certain skill or how they're doing so to prove ultimately to prove that as a company you did your best to you know advise the employee that they're not doing well and some maybe some ideas on how they can do well and as a company that you even tried to help this employee to better their employment at the company um if multiple people are asked to evaluate evaluate a specific employee make sure all the evaluations are documented. So if there's multiple people that are saying maybe different things or they may be reporting to a couple of people, you wanna make sure everything that was said during those meetings are properly documented. Uh, performance improvement plans is another one. Records relating to job offers, promotions, demotions, transfers, and layoffs. Uh, you wanna make sure that any transfer and layoff if if that ever does happen, you want to make sure that's properly documented because in the future, there can be things where the employees say, okay, I wasn't working here or this is when I started. You want to make sure that you have the proper documentation on when exactly an, a person worked at certain places or in certain positions and what their job duties were at the time. So if they were in a certain position and their job duty was to do a certain um a certain task, then that is their responsibility. Hence, they could still be, you know, given a warning notice if they didn't if they didn't perform their job duty well. Uh, pay and compensation information, letters of recognition and awards. Now, this could be employee of the month, week. If your company does do um, any type of recognition, if they send out an employee newsletter um, showing that this employee did something well, you want to make sure that you document that and you also make it makes sure that a copy of that award is in the employee personnel file. Now, this could also help when, let's say, you're possibly considering to promote an employee or even demote an employee. Um, when you do pull out the employee personnel file, you want to be able to see any type of recognition, things that the employee was, you know, recognized for, and that could actually help you uh, determine the decision that you're about to make or even the job offer that you're about to give the employee. Complaints from customers and or coworkers. I mean, that kind of relates right back to the poor, poor performance. Uh, one of the reasons that even if an employee, maybe they're doing well or in front of your eyes, they might be doing well, but you've been getting a lot of customer complaints from them and hearing that, you know, this employee is not responding efficiently or they're not, you know, they're not being professional when they speak to their customers. You want to make sure that you do have all that documentation, especially if an issue arises where it gets to the point that you believe this may, this employee may need to be separated from the company because they're not a good fit. You want to make sure that you have any type of documentation proving what, you know, what actions you took to even consider this option. So, and even to show the employee that, okay, like, you know, we're not separating you for absolutely no reason at all. You're, we're actually separating you due to, you know, the negative feedback that we constantly received. And we want to make sure that, you know, our company does have employees that uh, perform their job duties up to far. Um, next is warnings and or disciplinary actions. So if your company performs annual performance reviews, make sure that a copy of all documents provided to the employee is in the, is in the personnel file as well. A disciplinary action, 
should be a positive experience. I know most people, when they hear that, you know, we need to have a meeting to discuss your performance, they always, there's always a negative connotation around that whole experience. But ideally, uh, a disciplinary action is actually supposed to be a positive experience um, and you should be motivating the employee and not necessar necessarily punishing the employee. So, for example, like when you do speak to the employee, you could advise them, okay, like I love how you're doing this, you're doing this really well, and so on. But you can also, but you can also advise the employee, okay, but I do believe that these are some areas that you should be working on and that you could better and improve yourself. So that way, when the employee does walk out of a performance meeting or anything like that, they feel, instead of feeling discouraged, they're more encouraged to do better. And ultimately, most employees that do feel this way end up being better performance at the job. So when you do document um, any type of meetings that you do have with the employee, make sure you put down the date and time of meeting with the employee, uh, the individuals that were present during the meeting, make sure you describe the conduct. So the date, times and if there were any other individuals that were involved in that particular situation. So if you're talking to the employee about a certain situation that did occur, make sure um, everything is documented properly. So if there were other coworkers or colleagues or ma managers that were part of that experience, make sure that that's also documented. Uh, the policy or the procedure that was violated, and this kind of goes back to the whole acknowledgement, proving that the employee was aware of the policy that was um, that the company has, uh, the impact on the workplace. So if there was a certain impact, so if there's certain situations that arose and, um, and certain uh, other coworkers were also affected or clients were affected, you wanna make sure that that's all documented to prove the, almost the severity of the situation and why it's so important. Um, any previous ver verbal warning. So if you're now calling an employee after having numerous discussions or even um, providing an employee with certain warnings, you want to make sure that you show that, you know, this was something that was discussed and now you're getting to the point where the employee is just not improving at all or even if they're actually doing worse after the situation. So you want to show that as a company, you tried your best to, you know, help the employee um, and help improve their employment with the company. So this is all documentation to essentially protect both you and the employee. Action plan for improvement. So now this shows that the company is um, has some kind of action plan that they can give the employee that they believe will actually better their employment. Uh, consequences if performance is not improved. Uh, employee comments and rebuttal. And also make sure that the supervisor and employee signature is um, is also dated on the documentation that's provided. So in some situations, a lot or in a lot of situations, employees may refuse to sign the document or they may not disagree. disagree. And that's completely okay. Just make sure that you have that noted on the document or you know whatever is attached to the, to the documentation that the employee was spoken to and they actually refuse to sign the document because you know, ultimately you still did provide the documentation. So the next thing is education and training records. Um, so you wanna show that you, were, you did give the employee any proper training for specific tasks, especially if there's, let's say if, um, they're working on a software and, and you're giving them, they have to uh, participate in a certain training. You wanna make sure that you have proof that this employee did take part in certain trainings and they do have the knowledge to do this. Records of attendance or, tardy, or tardiness. Uh, any contract, written agreement, receipt, or acknowledgement between the company and the employee, employer, such as the non-compete agreement, an employment contract, or an agreement relating to a company provided card. Uh, documents relating to the worker's departure from the company, such as reasons why the worker left or was fired, termination notice, unemployment documents. So uh, when an employee is separated, uh, they most likely will file for unemployment. So in general, any employee that's separated from the company, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, always has the right to file for unemployment. 
So when they do file for the unemployment, you know, the Department of Labor will review their claims and they will see, okay, like, does this employee deserve benefits or not, or should be receiving benefits or not. So when this comes, uh, the DOL actually reaches out to the company or our client company to get copies of documents on why exactly this employee was separated, the reasons to it. So now if an employee was involuntarily separated, the Department of Labor actually ends up coming back to you and asks you for more documentation on why this employee was involuntarily separated. And they want to see proof that, you know, as a company, you still you did your best to try to help the employee or if it was like a situation like poor performance, performance or anything like that. Um, they also want to see that, you know, this employee did not get separated for something that wasn't actually their fault. Uh, so the DOL will be reaching out to you. So it's incredibly important to always make sure that your documentation is in place. Um, so you could always ultimately make sure that your company is protected no matter what decision they make regarding any employee that works there. Um, so when you do uh, speak to the employee, like some things that you should keep note is that personnel files should be kept for at least one year after the termination date. Uh, you, even if an employee is separated during, like, like I said about the separate uh, termination paperwork, employees that do leave the company or are separated, but you want to make sure that their personnel files, you still have copies of records because there's most probably like any kind of case, even if it's unemployment or, um, even other employers that are possibly thinking about hiring this employee, you want to make sure that you do have some sufficient documentation on the employee before you completely throw away the documents. Uh, you want documents easily available when evaluating an employee for a promotion, layoff, file tax returns, and even comply with government audits. Uh, this, employee, this personnel file can also turn into evidence for a possible lawsuit by a former employee and can protect your company. Uh, I think ultimately, you know, we always keep documents. I mean, we don't ever want a company that ever has to go through a lawsuit, but you should always plan for any employee that comes to your company as if, and like, you know, any, for any negative, negative repercussions. So you want to make sure that all those documents are in place because, of course, you're not, you're, you know, the likelihood of actually facing a lawsuit may be low, but you want to be prepared no matter what. Uh, so it's, they're very good preventative measures that the company can take to make sure that, you know, they're kept in line and they've done everything uh, to their absolute best. Um, begin the personnel file on the date that the employee was hired. So as soon as the employee is hired, you start that per personnel file and you start uh, putting everything related to that employee, like their job application, their resume, their hire, new hire paper, like everything related to that employee you wanted to start that on the date that the employee is hired um employers should review each employee personnel file around their annual review may be a good time to review it so you should be reviewing the employee personnel files if you believe that there are documents that maybe you know you're not always going to have time to immediately document something or like like at least the ones that are not as important. Um, you should make sure that when the annual annual performance review comes along, that's the best time to just take a look at the employee personnel file, make sure everything related to the employee's per employment is in the file. And if it's not, make sure that you do document and put that in there. Uh, and make sure everything is accurate, up to date and complete. Um, so some things that you should think about when uh, looking, reviewing the personnel file uh, is, does the file contain every written evaluation of the employee? Does it reflect the employee's raises and promotions? Are all written warnings or documentation rel relating to warnings in the file? If the employee was on a performance improvement, improvement plan, probationary period, or any other temporary status, has it ended? Has the file been updated to reflect this? I think when a lot of people are um, given a performance improvement plan, which is the plan that, you know, that's usually given when an employee is being disciplined or um, giving, uh, given some kind of action plan to help, uh, help improve their employment. You, there is usually an end date, or especially if the employee does improve, you want to make sure that performance improvement plan is end, like has an end date to it. 
to show that this employee did meet and did end up meeting up to the expectations and now they're continuing as a standard employee. So you want to make sure that the file does reflect this. Uh, if the handbook was updated since the employee started working with you, does the file contain a receipt of, of acknowledgement for the most recent version? Uh, so now, like, you know, there are definitely uh, the companies that have employees that work for a very, very long time. And throughout this time, you most probably will have updates to your handbook as state laws change, as, you know, policies change, as the company um, gets bigger and so forth. Um, they will be receiving some kind of policy update. So you wanna make sure that acknowledgement of the policy update is in the employee personnel file. So you don't want an employee to come back and say, you know, this was always a policy. I always followed it this way. Like you should have something that proves that no, there was a change to the policy and you did receive a copy of this um, policy update and you did acknowledge it as well. Uh, does the file contain current versions of every, every of every contract or agreement between you and the employee. So if, especially if you have an employee that's been working there for a while, maybe um, that you promoted them or demoted them and you have new contracts, make sure all contracts and their dates and times are all properly documented. Okay, so now next I have a poll question. Uh, so, how long should a company keep an employee personnel file? One second. Okay. So, you guys could answer over here. I'm going to give you guys two more seconds. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And then shift. Okay, so discarding here. Okay, so mostly everyone is right. I, I mean, it was <laughs> definitely all over the place, but yes, 48%. So, yes, it's it is rec recommended to keep an employee personnel file for at least one year after termination. Uh, but also remember that there are certain state laws regarding this. So if you do have employees in different states, uh, make sure that you do look up the state laws. So there are certain documents that certain states want uh, their employers to keep for a certain amount of time. So you wanna make sure that you do uh, look into the states that your company has employees in and that you're still adhering to all state laws. But in general, as a general and um, recommendation, it's always recommended that you keep the employee personnel, personnel files for at least minimum one year after the termination. Okay. So next, uh, we have what not to keep in a personnel file. So the first thing is medical records. Uh, so you are re legally required to keep all of an employee's medical records in a separate file and limit access to only a few people. Uh, medical records such as medical questionnaires, benefit claims, doctor's notes, accommodation requests, medical leave records, FMLA, state claims, private or, dis uh, private or state disability claims, they should all be kept in a certain file. Now, you don't want uh, something like this to be like I mean, this would be a HIPAA violation if you do end up having this an employee personnel file because remember employee personnel files most of most of the management at the company do have access to an employee's uh, personnel file. Met, when it comes to medical records, you don't want any manager or anybody in the company to possibly uh, discriminate an employer or look at an employee any differently because of a certain medical issue that they had. So you want to make sure that that's always confidential and you don't have that um, and people that shouldn't be, that shouldn't have access to it um, are 
accidentally have access to it or anything. Uh, workers' compensation claims, I-9, uh, background checks and drug test results. That's the same idea, especially for a drug test. That's also related to medical information. So you don't want the company. This is information that the company as a whole does not need to know about. Um, the EO1 voluntary self-identification form, the benefit enrollment and beneficiary designations, any child support garnishments. And remember, these things are, yes, you do receive these documents because as an employer, you do need to still state certain information about an employee if they do have these kind of documents. But they're not things that are related to the employee's um, employment with the company and should not be some, it should not be a factor when it comes to the, the employee's employment there. So, you know, whether or not you're looking at the employee and thinking if you want to promote them or even separate them, you don't want anything in the personnel file that kind of comes, comes off um, discriminatory to, uh, to the outside world or even within the company itself. Um, any litigation documents, uh, workplace investigation records, and unnecessary material. So like as much as there are so many things that you should be keeping in a personnel file, you don't want to go overboard. Um, most states allow employees to have access to their employee personnel, personnel file, and you don't want to add any documents related to the employee's private life or political beliefs, et cetera. So a lot of employ, uh, employers, you know, there is certain things that you do know about the employee or, you know, you're aware of. You don't want to include these things into a, per, into a personnel file because you want to make sure that the personnel file is as professional as possible. And if there was somebody to ever audit these documents, you don't want to, you don't want anything, any document that could possibly represent some kind of discriminatory um, method that you took against the employee. Okay. So next, so next slide, why document? Uh, it's for risk management. It protects the company. As I said, I, I said multiple times throughout the presentation already that your documentation and what you do for the employee and everything that you put in employee personnel for, file or things that you even don't will ultimately protect the company. So especially for companies that are new, um, you want to make sure that Everything that you put into the file that you're that you did everything possible to um, do everything legally and you have everything to prove an employee's employ employment with the company. Uh, this also emphasizes the seriousness of the matter. So if you do have an issue that arises between an employee, you want to have everything documented properly to show that as a company that you did address the issue and that you did your best to possibly resolve the issue. And um, and even if, you know, it was, a, it was a something that was easily resolved or took some time, you as a company did your best to make sure that, you know, this wasn't just, this wasn't just thrown to the side, and no employee was just ignored um, because of, of because of an issue that did come up. Uh, this also clarifies issues and improvements needed. Uh, it's also a strong communication tool. So let's say, like like I mentioned before, when you do have performance improvement plans or any performance reviews, this like you could look at this documentation and provide that to the employee and say, you know, you were given these documents or you were given these warnings and we also offered help in these areas so it shows the employee that as an employer that you did your best to even help the employee this also helps future managers so if you have um if you're a manager at the company and you need to document employee record like you know employee history you want to make sure that you document in a way where you know if you're if you move out of that position that other managers are are aware of the situation or are aware of you know how employees what what warnings were were given to certain employees and what has been their uh, job history like. So it has some sort of historical data um, that can help the future managers or anybody in that same position. Awesome. So when and how to document when as soon as possible ASAP. 
uh, as soon as a situation or event arises, uh, you want to make sure that you start the document documentation immediately. You want to put down exactly what happened, uh, everything that everything that uh, was related to the documentation, and also because mo like if the situation does arise, it's usually the most fresh in an employee's mind on the first day. So, or the first couple of days at least. So you don't want to delay. You don't want to do anything to delay a certain meeting or a certain conversation with people. And even if you do have that conversation, make sure that's documented. Uh, no matter how strong your memory is, or um, or anything like that, you should always make sure you document immediately so you have something to refer back to. Uh, how be specific. Uh, make sure you're specific with what happened. Uh, don't personalize the objective. So when you do write out a document, you don't want to say, oh, he, you know, he was like this, or she said that, or you don't want to say anything that looks like you're taking a side, um, a, a certain employee side, especially if you're, you know, if it involves two employees. You want to be as objective as possible. You want to say this employee stated this, or that, and uh, make sure that that's documented properly. Uh, state facts, such as dates, times, and examples, uh, and also allow and encourage employee feedback and discussion. So you want to make sure that the employee does, you know, say their part and be able to kind of protect themselves and be able to say exactly what happened uh, during the situation. So that way you're making, you're taking all, you're taking a look into all sides of a certain situation. Okay. So now I'm gonna hand it back over to Dan to go into further detail. All righty, thank you, Lee, I do appreciate that. <clears throat> all right, we're gonna jump right into another poll question, so you guys can all um, go ahead and answer this. The question is, what is one document that you should not keep in a personnel file? The offer letter, the performance reviews, I-9s, or a job description? Go ahead and open the poll. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and close it. All righty, so it looks like most of all you guys are correct. That is 96% of you guys did say that I-9 should not be included in the personnel file, and you are absolutely correct. And we're going to go into detail as to why. All right, so I-9 documentation. You always want to make sure that you store these in the, uh, separately from the personnel file. Um, there are a couple reasons as to why this is. Um, you have to keep in mind that the I-9 document is probably the most important document, if anything, um, relating to your employees in the workplace. Um, you want to make sure that these are stored efficiently. Um, so by doing so, you want to store these in a different, um, a, a different way as opposed to the personnel file. Um, there are a couple options you can do. A lot of people are moving more to um, an online approach or a digital uh, uh, way of doing that, and that's something you can do, and that's something I'm going to explain later on. Um, but if you're kind of old school and you like to have that paper copy of the I-9, the ideal um, way to do this is to put the I-9s in a separate binder. Um, you would probably want to do this by um, organizing by the employee's last name uh, followed by the first name. Um, and you would want to have um, separate tabs. So you'll have the active employees, you'll list them all in alphabetical order, and then you'll have the uh, terminated employees on the back side. Um, you can separate them into two separate binders if you feel that that's more necessary and meets your, uh, um, meets your company's needs. Uh, you can have a terminated binder and an active binder. Um, this is mostly because um, you want to keep these separated, mostly because of what we talked about earlier, um, as the I-9 does contain national origin, um, immigration status, marital status, all this information that not every supervisor should have access to. Um, so, like I said, you want to keep these alphabetical. They're going to be um, way easier to maintain if you do it this way. Um, going into um, ter the termination section, um, so the the reason why you want to do this um, again is because you know you keep it separated. When an employee terminates the company, you can just pull their I nine, put it into the termination file, um, and then keep it um, all organized that way. 
So there are two ways that you can keep your I-9s for the terminating employees um, organized. And there are some protocols um, that you do have to take um, when um, having employees I-9, even once they leave the company. So you want to keep the I-9 for one year after the employee terminates the company. Um, all I-9 should be uh, kept for at least one year. Um, a good practice is to um, place a little uh, note or a sticky note on the I-9 that puts the employee's termination date on it. That's a great tool to do that so that when you're going through maybe every month or so, you can put a little process in place to say, hey, let me check my binder and see uh, what I-9s I can shred or take out because it's been past the one year. Um, so an example of this would be, um, if an employee terminates on February 9th, 2014, then the one year after termination date would be February 9th, 2015. Um, the other option is to determine the three years after the hire date. So this is where it kind of gets a little confusing. Um, all the I-9 forms must be at least retained for at least three years after the date of hire. So therefore, the second date you would write down on your sticky note is the three years after the hired date. So, for example, if employee A was hired on May 4th, 14th, 2012, then the three year after hire date would be um, uh, May 14th, 2015, and that's what she would write on the sticky note. So again, I know that's a little tricky, and if, if you guys have additional questions, feel free to um, ask us after the presentation, or you can always email us and we can um, help you with that, because it is a little tricky. All right, so um, the next section is um, establish the most latest retention date, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, whatever is more um, easier, it's the one year after termination or the three years after hire. Um, there are a few shortcuts that you can do um, to help you out with this. Um, because of all, because all current employees must have an I-9 on file, the three years after higher retention requirements is already met for an employee who has been employed with the organization for three years. Therefore, all the I-9s for all employees who terminate after the three years of employment are simply retained for one year after termination. So for those employed for less than three years, the above calculations uh, would be made to ensure the employer has the form I-9 in its position for a minimum of three years from the date of hire. Okay, all right. Um, so a way to organize the termination, uh, terminate employee documents is in chronological order by retention date. That is another option you can do if you feel like um, if you want to put the terminate employees um, I-9s in order by the date that is easier for you, go ahead and do that. Or if you like keeping it chronological by alphabetical order, you can do that as well. Um, just make sure that um, that you are, you know, be on top of that because there are fines and stuff associated with um, retention rate for I-9s. So, um, the last section of this would be um, when can you shred the terminated I-9s, um, uh, the terminated I-9 employee? Well, the employees sh should check, you should check the first few terminated I-9s in this section um, to see if any retention dates have passed. If so, go ahead and um, terminate it and shred it in the shredder. All right, I got another great uh, question for you guys. So we're going to um, go right into this. Who should have access to the employee personnel files? Is it A, head of human resources, B, the building maintenance crew, C, the receptionist, or D, the Kardashians? We're going to go ahead and open that poll. So go ahead. You got 10 seconds on the clock. All right, we're going to go ahead and close that poll. It looks like most of you guys have already answered. And you guys are correct. 94%, um, the head of human resources should have access to uh, your employee's personnel file. And the 6% of you guys said the Kardashians. I don't think they should have access to your personnel file. But, I mean, who knows? If later down the road, if that becomes a law, who knows? But <laughs> until then, the head of human resources should be um, the one who has access to your personnel file. So lock them up.
So this is where it kind of gets um, a little more crucial at this point as to um, who should, um, you know, have access to the files. Um, so employers, you want to make sure that you implement safeguards to protect your employee information. Um, identity theft has become one of the top consumer fraud issues. So the Federal Trade Commission reports that identity theft tops the list of consumer complaints that are reported every year. So therefore, every employer, you must maintain records that um, are at risk for theft and misuse. Therefore, you should really only give access to um, employees at a need no basis. So you don't want to just go ahead and just, you know, everyone that works in the company has access to your employee personnel files. You don't want to do that. Even within the department, you don't want to, I mean, if you're in an HR department, you've got maybe like five people in your department, you don't want to give access to everybody. I would probably try to keep it down to a minimum because um, the more people that you do have access, the more you're opening your company up to liability. Um, so with that being said, um, you want to make sure that you maintain the files in a locked file cabinet. Um, you want to make sure that um, you ensure access to the filing cabinet to a few couple people. Um, this again could be your head of HR or maybe an HR journalist of the company. Um, just really keep those numbers to a minimum. Um, you only want to have only allow employees um, by that department to have access, which is kind of what I just mentioned. Um, and then just ensure that the contacts are not visible um, for everyone in the company to see. So by an example, of this would be, you know, if you pull the employee's personnel file and you're reviewing it at your desk, say you get up to go to the restroom or to go to the um, whatever, the kitchen, whatever, you want to make sure that you do close that document and maybe store it in your desk somewhere. So it's just not right out there in the open so that anyone that walks by can possibly see it. You want to make sure that you do keep that really secure. Um, and then, you know, just check state specific requirements um, for the duration of uh, the employee personnel file uh, that Leah talked about earlier. All right, so here are some, uh, some penalties. Um, so the EOC regulations require that the employers keep all the personnel and employment records for at least one year. If an employee is involuntarily terminated, his or her personnel file and records must be retained for at least one year from the date of termination. Um, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, the FLSA, um, employers must keep payroll records for at least three years. In addition, employers must keep um, the following um, items for um, a minimum of two years. Um, those items include wage rates, job evaluations, seniority and merit systems, and collective bargaining agreements. So this will help um, explain if an audit was ever um, conducted of your company. Um, by keeping these forms on hand, it will explain the basis for why you were paying different wages for different employees of the opposite sex um, within the establishment. So you want to um, check the state um, specifics as well because some, like I said, California has different um, state specifics and I'm sure there are a couple other states within um, the nation that do have requirements and retention dates as well. All right, so we're going to go ahead and um, check the questions and kind of see if you guys have any um, questions um, regarding this presentation. All right, so we have one question by um, a, a listener who basically says, can you keep the medical records and all the other papers on this list in the same file? Um, Leah, do you want to answer that question since you kind of uh, went over that, that slide? Yeah, so, uh, no, uh, sorry, from the list itself, one second. So everything in the medical file, it should be kept separate uh, from the employee personnel file. So if you do have a employee personnel file, you want to make sure that you uh, specifically have one file for only medical records. So, and even if you do have uh, disability claims that may have happened, um, you know, in previous years, it's good to keep all of that in one uh, one folder so you're not going looking for three different medical files. You want to make sure that everything is kept in one file, um, but that's separate from everything else. And what's the next question? Awesome. Um, another question that we have, I do see, is um, do you have to keep a copy of the W-4 in the, um, if the employer is completing it on the pulse system that we have for, with CoAdvantage? 
Um, the answer to that is ideally yes. Um, it's not required. Um, I would suggest that you do ask the employee to keep a paper copy, just something that you keep on record because it's, it's a little bit easier for them to um, uh, pull that document. But as in regards to the pull system, um, a lot of people, when you do submit changes online, a lot of times the um, updates are printed on a, um, a W-4 online and it is stored there. But like I said, it's always good to keep a per, uh, paper copy within the employee file. All right, so I'm going to move on to our next slide. All right, so where do we go from here, you guys? So um, first, always call your HR consultant, or we have the HR Service Center information right here on the screen. Um, if you did not, if you enter this webinar late, um, you do have access to um, view the, the webinars online at coadvantage.com slash resources. And to stay up to date on other additional webinars, um, you can register for um, upcoming CoAdvantage webinars or view past webinars by visiting www.coadvantage.com slash webinars. And this right here will show you guys the updated list of what's yet to come. Um, if you guys tune in in April, we do have um, a webinar based on um, spring into compliance, so cleaning up employee handbook policies. Great topic right there, especially with all the laws that are constantly changing. You want to make sure that your handbooks are always up to date. And again, we want to thank you guys so much for um, uh, participating in our presentation today. Uh, my name is Daniel Mater, um, and Leah was fantastic. Her information is on there as well. These are our numbers, our emails, and you can always email the HR service team as well. So thank you guys so much for uh, tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you guys on our next webinar.